hours and we intend to finish around 7 30 p.m we will allow our speakers by yesterday's deadline to speak that seems to be the the fair and equitable way to proceed with this a number of us have an over two hour drive to get back to our homes tonight so you'll forgive us if we keep it to the list of folks who have registered to speak by yesterday's deadline please do keep your comments to two minutes uh, we will ask you to finish up at two minutes we did a pretty good job at that at the first meeting uh, so thank you for everyone in advance for keeping your comments to that time period laura and myself will, will let you know when the two minute uh Deadline is up and we'll ask you to finish your thought and make way for the next speaker. Please also be civil and respectful in your comments. We're here to learn what the public has to say at this point, not, not debate uh, any potential rule yet. And for folks that want to provide written comments on the petition, those are being accepted through July 29th at 4 p.m. A few more housekeeping notes. If you're participating virtually, please keep your microphone muted unless speaking. If you're on the phone, and you're signed up to make a comment, you have to push star and then six to unmute before speaking. During the comment phase, we'll call speakers' names in order uh, that the request to speak was received. If you're in the room, please come to the front of the podium to speak. This microphone is for the, the speakers in the room, so those in the room can hear, and the microphone on my computer is picking up your voice so the folks online can hear. If you're participating virtually, when you, when you hear your name called by Laura, please unmute your microphone and turn on your camera before speaking and then mute your microphone after speaking. We do have 48 registered speakers prior to, prior to yesterday's deadline. And so, as I said, we'll cut it off when we, when we finish that list, unless we happen to get through all 48 by 7.30 p.m., in which case we'll take additional speakers. We do have a few repeat speakers from last week's hearing. That's fine. But for the repeat speakers, please recognize that there's a lot of other people that want to speak and haven't had a chance to do so yet. Please do respect the... Um, Two minute limit. Oh, that was interesting. So I'm going to move on um, back to the presentation. So um, I'm going to provide some background on the use of public waters rule, which is the legislative framework, the rulemaking framework for which uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation has the authority to administer the use of public waters rule. So the rules themselves are derived from statute. The reference is up there 10 BSA 1424. The Vermont legislature saw fit to allow the use of public waters, recreational uses, aquatic habitat uses, other uses to be governed through a rulemaking process originally administered by the Water Resources Panel, today administered by the Department of Environmental Conservation and the Agency of Natural Resources. In general, our approach is that Vermont's public waters are held in public trust for the benefit of all Vermonters and visitors, and public recreational uses are in general protected. Public waters can be used for a variety of recreational activities. And the, the public water rules highlights these uses here, wilderness and solitude, wildlife watching, winter recreation, fishing, non-motorized boating, motorized boating, both high speed and low speed, water skiing, personal watercraft operation, and seaplanes. So the key point in the public waters rule is that not every form of recreation is authorized on every water body. And we, we have certain water bodies where certain types of recreation activities are prohibited, and certain types of recreation activities are allowed, and the rules are very clear on that. Our public waters also provide habitat for aquatic biota, drinking and irrigation water, and many other designated uses as defined in Vermont's water quality standards, which in turn are derived from the Federal Clean Water Act. And so it's it's the state is required to maintain, to manage these waters to make compl maintain compliance with these standards, maintaining compliance with the water quality standards enters into our decision making regarding the use of public waters. And the public water rules finally govern aquatic resources management very generally and establish rules to protect all these normal uses on Vermont's public waters. Um, so getting to some of the specifics, the rules restrict the type of motorized watercraft that may be operated on certain water bodies and set speed limits for motorized watercraft. Some of the rules apply to all public water bodies, such as the 200 foot shoreline safety zone, which is a no wake or five mile per hour zone. And many rules are, are lake specific. Um, I think folks are familiar with the rules, but certain lakes have specific speed limits. Uh, I think it's uh, Casper, Caspian Lake up in Greensboro has a 10 mile per hour speed limit sometimes a day and a 40 mile per hour speed limit other times a day. So that's just one example of a lake specific rule. The rules also provide guidance for the review of petitions from the public seeking the adoption of new rules to regulate the use of public waters. So when the public water rules were put forth, they anticipated 
petition, such as the one that we're doing tonight, coming in to make either specific or general rules for the use of public waters. And also pursuant to these rules, we're required to manage public waters by we, I mean the Agency of Natural Resources in a manner that avoids or resolves conflicts in the use of public waters in a comprehensive manner so that various uses on public waters may be enjoyed. We're required to consider the safety and best interest of current and future generations of Vermonters. We're required to ensure that natural resource values of the public waters are fully protected and provide an appropriate mix of water-based recreational activities and opportunities on a statewide basis. So historically, the rules were administered by the Water Resources Panel of the Natural Resource Board. In May of 2012, about 10 years ago, the Vermont Legislature passed Act 138, which transferred rulemaking authority from the Water Resources Panel and Natural Resource Board to the Agency of Natural Resources. And so the agency, through my division that I work for, the Watershed Management Division and the Department of Environmental Conservation, has the responsibility to manage and administer a number of surface water rules, including these public water rules, it's our responsibility to receive and review petitions to adopt, amend, or repeal these rules. We developed procedures in 2013 to help us support the review of petitions that are intended to promote a clear, transparent, and consistent decision-making process, as well as assist petitioners with what to expect with their petition when it is submitted. So we're following those procedures today. They're available on our website if you want to read those. And those procedures are consistent with the use of public, rule, use of public water rules requirement, and the former uh, Natural Resource Board rules of procedure, which are still in, in effect today. So these procedures, the different steps are up here on the, on the screen. Um, the first step is this petition has to be submitted in line with established procedures. When a petition comes in, we review it, make sure it's administratively complete. There's sometimes some back and forth with the petitioners to get there. Then the petition is marked administratively complete, and we make it publicly available. We're required to consult with Fish and Wildlife, Forest Parks and Recreation, and State Police Marine Division in these procedures. Um, we've done that already. And we're now at this phase of public participation, um, which is uh, going to, at this today and last week, involve taking verbal comment from the public or taking written comments. There will be additional phases of public participation, more or less compliance with Section 2.4 of the Visa of Public Water Rules, which uh, requires us to in addition to Forest Parks and Rec, Fish and Wildlife, State Police, Marine Division, Public Safety, to also meet with affected user groups. So that'll be a, a subsequent step in our public participation aspect and review of this petition. Then we get to the analysis of the petition, all the public comments we've received, what does the statute say, what do rules say, and the scientific literature that may or may not be relevant uh, regarding this petition. Following that step, we make a recommendation to our department and agency leadership on whether to deny the petition or to advise, really it's the secretary's decision uh, to whether or not to initiate formal rulemaking. And it's important to note that rulemaking, if we do get to that phase, could begin using the petition that was proposed, excuse me, using the proposed rule in the petition or a revision of, of that proposed rule based on staff review at the Agency of Natural Resources. Once this decision is made by our agency leadership, we will provide formal notice of this decision to all concerned parties. That's again, the decision of whether or not to initiate formal rulemaking. If the secretary decides to initiate formal rulemaking in response to this petition, we'll follow another established statutory process for rulemaking references there through VSA 800. And that's the process involving multiple committees, one that reports to Governor Scott, one that reports to the legislature, it's governed by the Secretary of State, and there'll be additional public comment in that phase as well. So as you can see, this is just the beginning of a long process with additional public comment and additional committee review, et cetera. Um, so that's sort of legal framework for reviewing this rule. I'm gonna stop there. Um, just wanna see if there's another introduction to make. The uh, gentleman in the back uh, sitting on the aisle, uh, Judging by how you dress, I think you might be a representative of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Do you mind, do you mind speaking into the microphone on my computer? Uh, sorry to single you out. It's just, I, it's, I, I really appreciate the presence of our, our colleagues in state government here. I just wanted to give you the chance to introduce yourself. Likewise. Uh, good uh, evening, afternoon, whatever it may be right now. Um, Travis Buttle, I'm a Sergeant State Game Warden with Vermont Fish and Wildlife here to represent the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thanks. 
for those that were on that didn't hear, uh, I think everyone heard um, Sergeant Jacob Matera's introduction because I spoke into the microphone before we got there. So what I want to do now is invite Meg Handler to give the, the petition, excuse me, the presentation from the petitioners, and then we'll take any clarifying questions on either what I had to say or what Meg has to say. So we're going to quickly shift gears uh, over to um, Meg's presentation. Share the screen so everybody online can see this. Oh, it's yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Oliver and Laura, for hosting again this second public hearing. We are grateful for the opportunity to speak here today. I know you all came to comment on our proposal, and I know you have a lot of questions. I am going to try to anticipate those questions and answer them as best I can. As Oliver said, I am Meg Handler. I am a member of Responsible Wakes for Vermont Lakes, and I live on Lake Iroquois in Hinesburg, Vermont. This picture was taken last Thursday in Richmond. It shows members of our group meeting for the first time in person, right before the public hearing up in the northern part of the state. We are a much larger group than this, of course. Only a fraction could make it in person to the hearing. But as you can see, we are a group of very ordinary people who came together well over a year ago from all over the state, from at least 15 different lakes and ponds, from a variety of different backgrounds, all motivated by a concern about wake boats and what they might be doing to our lakes and ponds. We who enjoy the water in all different ways. We are motor boaters, kayakers, water skiers, paddle boarders, sailors, tubers, rowers. We swim, we fish, we stare at the water and do nothing. We watch birds, we look for turtles, you name it, our members are doing it. Over a year ago, we came together and started looking at the problems posed by wake boats. We met regularly over Zoom to figure out what we should do. We posed questions to one another and to ourselves. We developed action items and then we ran off to find answers and think over solutions. We argued and challenged one another repeatedly. In the end, we developed a set of principles to guide us. Follow the science, feel empathy for those who enjoy wake sports, protect the environment, ensure water safety. We looked up all the published research we could find. We referenced all the studies. We did not cherry pick, ignoring studies that might not support our ideas. Instead, we included and addressed everything we found. I realize many of you have not read the entire petition. I don't blame you. It is exhaustive, long, detailed, technical. It is an impressive piece of work put together over a year's time by dedicated people trying hard to do the right thing. Beyond that, we talked to people all over the country and in Canada. This is a national movement. There are individuals and groups wrestling with this, working to support thoughtful management of wake boats in states across the country. We connected with national groups, we analyzed data, we developed ideas, discussed them, rejected them. We advocated and argued for different ideas amongst ourselves, determined to come up with a plan that was fair, balanced, based in science, and relevant to all the inland lakes and ponds in Vermont. We worked on this a long time 
to come up with our proposed rule. The rule is straightforward. 1,000 feet from shore, 20 feet of depth, more than 60 acres. As you can see, this rule does not ban wake boats. People who love wake sports are free to practice their sport on many lakes throughout Vermont. Lake Champlain and Lake Memphremagog are not affected by this rule. Bomacine, Willoughby, Caspian, Dunmore, Maury, St. Catherine, and many other lakes have wake sport zones where boarding and surfing will continue. What this rule does is to recognize that not all activities are appropriate to all locations. Our proposed rule conforms to common practice. We already balance different recreational interests all the time, all across the state. I have dogs that I like to walk off leash, but there are some places I can do that and some places where I can't. There are places where people can ski, but not snowshoe, operate snowmobiles, but not ATVs, hike, but not mountain bike, mountain bike, but not hike. The most relevant example of this is jet skis. There are lakes in Vermont where people can operate jet skis, but there are other lakes, smaller lakes, where jet skis are prohibited. Again, our proposed rule does not ban wake boats. It simply designates places where wake sports are appropriate and places where they are not. Wake boats are different from other boats. Wake boats are intentionally designed to create giant waves suitable for doing tricks or for surfing behind a boat, much like surfing on ocean waves. To accomplish this, wake boats take on weight in large ballast tanks that are filled with lake water to weigh down the back of the boat. New technology is being developed all the time to create as big a wake as possible. An artificially enhanced wake sends huge waves out behind the boat. In addition, the powerful engine is angled downward, blasting a stream of water down toward the bottom of the lake. In certain circumstances, this design has unintended consequences for lake ecology and for other people trying to enjoy the lake. Large waves create problems for people by swamping kayaks and canoes, bowling over swimmers, especially children, crashing onto shore and damaging docks and boats. Our petition includes many stories told by people who have experienced these problems firsthand. Large waves create problems for the environment by crashing onto the shore, causing shoreline erosion, which not only ruins the shoreline, but also disrupts wildlife and adds unwanted phosphorus back into suspension in the water. Phosphorus makes the water murky and feeds algae blooms. Powerful engines angled down, stir up mud and plants in shallow water, sending plumes of dirt up into the water again, adding phosphorus to the lake. And those same engines uproot and churn up invasive plants like Eurasian water milfoil, allowing them to fragment and spread throughout the lake. Wake boats can also contribute to the spread of aquatic invasive species through their large ballast tanks. These tanks cannot be completely emptied. When wake boats travel from lake to lake, they can transport inv invasive plants like milfoil from one lake to another, spreading them throughout the state. I know I said this before, but I cannot stress it enough. Our proposed rule does not ban wake boats. And more importantly, 
this proposed rule does not touch the many other fun activities that people currently enjoy on Vermont's lakes and ponds. It does not touch water skiing or tubing or even wakeboarding behind a conventional motorboat. Wake boats are a small niche category, relatively new to the state. Wake boats cost a lot of money. There are not that many people here in Vermont using wake boats right now, and a whole lot of people doing other things. We think now is the right time to act here in Vermont because people across the country are warning us about what is coming our way. We see what is happening in other states and we see that this sport is growing fast. Before long, where there were three wake boats, there will be 10 or 20 or 50. How many will be too many? What do we gain by waiting until our lakes are overrun? Right now, this rule will not affect a lot of people because most people enjoying Vermont's lakes and ponds are not taking part in wake sports. Right now, this proposed rule stands to impact very few people. This proposed rule actually stands to benefit the vast majority of lake users and offers the opportunity to enhance and preserve our water quality for generations to come. There are individuals and organizations across Vermont, in other states, and even in Canada supporting this petition. We have over 30 letters of support from lake associations, town conservation commissions, select boards, local and state environmental groups, fishing groups, and many others. Names you might recognize supporting this petition. Sierra Club, Audubon Vermont, Vermont Natural Resources Council, Vermont Center for Eco Studies, Connecticut River Conservancy, Trout Unlimited, and many, many more. We are hopeful that DEC will appreciate how many people support this petition. We are hopeful that DEC will recognize what is happening in the wake sport industry. And we are hopeful that DEC will anticipate future growth of these wake enhanced sports and will act quickly to manage wake boats now to preserve our future, a future filled with all the natural beauty and diverse recreational opportunities that we enjoy and appreciate here in Vermont. Please support and adopt the proposed rule to manage wake boats on Vermont's inland lakes and ponds. Thanks, Meg. Uh, I have just two more quick slides to share before we go to the public comment phase. I'm going to bring those up as quickly as I can. Um, just to show the impact of the proposed rule on public water use in Vermont, so concretely. So, what I'm trying to show is the proposed rule uh, would allow lake sports on 15 lakes covered by the use of public water rules in defined wake sports zone of at least 60 acres. Those 15 lakes and reservoirs are listed here. Um, Chittenden and Somerset reservoirs could allow wake boats based on their shape and size and depth, but they have existing speed limits that in the case of Chittenden would prohibit Wake sports, and I, I understand that wake sports require a speed of at least 9.5 miles per hour. So I think it would effectively prohibit wake sports in Somerset, but that's something we can figure out at a later date. And you can see that the, the rule that Meg referenced on jet skis, which requires personal watercraft to be used on lakes 200 acres or greater, which is an existing rule, means that jet skis are allowed on 31 lakes in Vermont. As Meg said as well, the proposed rule would not apply to lakes and reservoirs that are that cross uh, into other state and, and international jurisdictions. So Champlain, Memphremagog, Wallace Pond, and eight reservoirs and the Connecticut, Reser Connecticut River reservoirs would not be affected by this rule because they're not governed by the Visa Public Waters rule. And there are a number of 
if you can see on the list on the left, the smallest lake that meets the criteria proposed in the rule is Little Averill at 470 acres. And all the other lakes that meet the criteria are larger. There are seven lakes that, that are larger than Little Averill, but because of their narrow shape, do not meet the requirements in the proposed rule. Shelburne, Hortonia, Norton, and the three reservoirs, Arrowhead, Waterbury, and Harriman. And then Green River Reservoir doesn't allow for motorized vessels at a speed of greater than five miles per hour. So those are just an additional seven larger water bodies where the proposed rule was enacted, uh, wake boats would be prohibited. So that's the end of the petition. We'll take some clarifying questions now, uh, at the end of the presentation rather. We'll take some clarifying questions. Again, just any questions to clarify what was in my presentation or Meg's. And then we'll get into the public comment phase. Uh, so we'll start here in the room. Uh, does anybody in the room have a clarifying question on either of the two presentations? Sir. And please come up to the mic so that people online can hear you. I, these virtual meetings are uh, challenging. If, I, if it is a clarifying question, great, we'll answer it. If it's a more detailed question, we'll table it and answer it in writing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Jim Morgan and I live on Lake Fairley and I, I did have two questions. I have a wake boat. I've had it for two years. I guess it runs the smaller gamut of size. The wake is 3.4 feet. It's not four feet or five feet um, and it uses ballast tanks. So here's my confusion. I would feel guilty with ballast tanks transporting my boat, which has no foil to any other lake in the state, which is what you suggested I should have to do to use it. I don't think I'd want to do that. The second is the only lake that's within 60 miles of where I live is Lake Maury, which has perhaps the most difficult boat ramp in the state. It's a direct downhill 90 degree turn. I don't think I could manage that. So having a new wake boat. It sounds more like a comment than a question. Yeah, here's the question. the question. So with all of those factors, what do I do with my boat? If you ban wake boats from the lake I live on, that's my question. Thank you. I'll take that next. So that's a thank you for the question. Yeah, it's a question that was better suited to be answered in writing. What I can say is, if I understand the petition correctly, you you would be allowed to use your boat in the non wake surf mode on Lake Fairly where you live. Any other clarifying questions in the room? Great, Laura, did, did you see any any requests for clarifying questions online or can, or can we get into the comment period? Great. Yeah, I don't see any, right. sir. Good afternoon, uh, Ben McLaughlin. Oliver, these are a couple for you on your side. Um, can you comment further on the how you modify as you see fit with you and your team with the as you modify the petition going through the various in, uh, departments? Second is uh, what's the expected timeline? And number three, is there an appeal process? So those three questions, uh, how do how might we modify the proposed rule? So. This is the public hearing. This is the first step in our public participation process. Um, comments are coming in verbally and in writing. We're going to review those. Section 2.4 of the public water rules uh, requires us as the entity responsible to convene some additional meetings and get comment from uh, affected user groups, which I would which I would include anyone that recreates on Vermont's waters, be it a motorized vessel user or wake boat vessel a non-motorized vessel user. So we'll do some of that. We'll reach out to different user groups. I also want to reach out to uh, vendors, points of sale for uh, motor boats to get their perspective on this. I know we have some with us today, but we might do that again in a more structured fashion. We've already asked Fish and Wildlife, uh, Forest Parks and Rec, and Public Safety for their comments. We'll incorporate those. Um, and then Agency of Natural Resource staff will review all the uh, feedback petition itself, the scientific literature, statute in Vermont, and, and through a period of, of and also the, the result of those discussions with groups that need to decide we have a proposed rule. We're going to propose that to our secretary based on our work, or we might convene some some additional groups. As Bruce Epstein pointed out at the last 
meeting and the, the when these sort of water rules was, was promulgated in the mid 90s. It was really meant as a conflict resolution tool. And in some of the rules that were put forth for specific water bodies, Waterbury Reservoir being an example, were the result of getting different interest groups together in the same room and trying to hammer out a compromise. And this is a statewide rule, so it's not as easy as saying who's interested in one recreating on one lake. But that's something that I'm definitely going to consider pursuing if we believe that that can add value to the process. So long story short, we have some additional public consultation to do, our own analysis, and I'll make a recommendation to the secretary based on all that work on whether or not to initiate rulemaking. Uh, and if so, what the proposed rule that we recommend should be the subject of that rulemaking based on that work. And again, it's the secretary's decision on, on how to proceed. That was your first question. I know your second question was time, or one of your other points was timeline. So I'll talk about that timeline. So the, the, the nice thing is for us, the rules don't say this has to be done in 30 days, 60 days, et cetera. But if we think that we can spend a few months after the 29th of July, when the when the comment deadline is, reviewing all the comments that came in, we'll, as I said, we'll eventually post responses to comments that, that sort of require a response. If it's just, I support this petition or I oppose this petition, we're not going to respond. But if there's a question or a factual point or an anecdotal observation, we'll respond to those. And then I think we will need a, a few months to, to sort through all that, sort through the comments, and do these additional uh, public consultation steps that I mentioned, um, and then start kicking a, a, an idea around about our decision, deny the petition, proceed with rulemaking as is, proceed with rulemaking as amended. So I, I, you know, I, I can't really enter into specifics because we haven't reviewed a statewide rule like this uh, in quite some time, but I'd like to think that we would have a, a recommendation to the secretary. Um, I'm going to sort of hedge on this one before the end of the calendar year. There's a third element to your question. Can you remind me what that was? Yeah. So as I said, the piece of the water rules allows for uh, people to submit petitions to amend the rules or to appeal rules. So if we go to rulemaking, it's another very involved process. We, we have to post our proposed rule with the Secretary of State. We have to present our proposed rule to the Interagency Committee on Administrative Rulemaking that's represented by people working for Governor Scott. We then have to probably do some additional public meetings. And the final step is the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rulemaking, which is comprised of members of the Vermont State Legislature. So that's kind of the a gamut. Any rule has to go through in Vermont based on statute. Each of those committee hearings plus additional public meetings Actually, they're, they're called hearings at that point. Does do provide opportunities for people to continue to comment, pre present opinions, and you know, well, just to be frank, people can try to influence members of those committees to support or uh, uh, object to any proposed rule that that we put forth. Um, finally, if 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 a proposed rule gets through those particular hearings, the secretary uh, has to um, sign off on it, and it becomes official when the new rules are promulgated. At that point. Yes, you could submit a petition to repeal. Repeal is actually the word that's used. It's it's more of a repeal of an existing rule. I'm not so I'll just I'll finish by saying this. I'm not aware of any process to appeal uh, an existing rule, but I'm going to make a note of that and I'll respond in writing because I need to consult with the lawyers. I know you, I know there's a process to repeal, but I don't know about appeal. Do you, you should take my difference? So this is from uh, Nicole McPhee. Uh, go ahead, Nicole. Hi. Um, I was wondering when you discuss um, wake zones, what are we talking about um, distance? And I, I just did some research online. I see that the most recent legislation in other states is 250 feet from any swimmer, uh, dock, et cetera. Are you looking at more than that? Yeah, I'll just briefly answer that. So today, the the East Public Water Rules and other statute in Vermont require a 200 foot distance from shore before going greater than five miles per hour. That's the no wake zone. Okay. And boaters are required to keep a 200 foot distance from other uh, people recreating on, on lakes and ponds. What the proposed rule states is Wake sports would be limited to zones that meet three requirements, a thousand feet from shore on all sides. So think of a polygon or a, a rectangle that's a thousand feet from shore on all sides, at least 20 feet deep and a minimum of 60 contiguous acres. So um, 
I, I can that we, we do have maps that we've been making that show what that looks like. I'll be very brief and, and flash that up on the screen here. Uh, I, just need, I need to folks in the room can see it already. Uh, we need to quickly share my screen for folks online uh, so you can see what that looks like. Um, this is what a, a, a wake sport zone would look like on two water bodies um, on the left. Sorry, I can't see the screen. I mean, left is Lake Maury in Fairley, Vermont. The wake sport zone would be limited to that red polygon uh, in the middle of the lake that meets those three criteria. Great Averill Pond in northern Vermont, it would be limited again to the red polygon. That's the lake on the right. That deep red zone at the bottom is 20, it's 1,000 feet from shore. It's you can take your sacred, but it's not 20 feet deep. So that deep red zone, because it's only 15 feet, would be sort of carved out. And the wake sport zone would be only the area that has that uh, red polygon with, with 20 feet depth. That's what the proposed rule states. And hand how, it over. how did Let's, you um, reach a thousand feet? Like, what's the necessity if other states are looking at two fifty? So that's more of a of a that's more of a detailed question that's explained in the petition. Uh, I, I think we're going to table that question for now. Feel free to submit it in writing, or we'll link a note of it. But the the rationale for that position is explained in the petition. Meg, do you want to briefly answer that question? Well, I want to get up to the public comment phase, but um, yeah, so I would encourage you to review the petition. It's clearly explained in there why they chose the in their proposed rule, the thousand foot definition. Um, so great. In the interest of time, I'm going to hand it over to uh, my colleague Laura, who's going to walk through the public comment phase of the meeting. The screen is not being shared. Okay. All right. So. Um, Folks who got in touch and signed up to get on the list will be called on in the order in which they signed up. We are gonna, we have a lot of people signed up, so we're gonna try hard to keep it to two minutes. I'm gonna give you a warning, ask you to wrap it up, and we're gonna move on. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone that the public comment period is open until July 29th, so you can submit comments in writing up until then. We will respond to all of them. So first on the list is David Dean. David, are you online? I didn't see his name. All right. Okay, so next on the list is Wallace Bruce. You'll have to unmute yourself. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Wallace Bruce. I live on Lake Raven, an 835 acre, once idyllic, clear mountain lake in the Appalachian foothills of Northeast Georgia. I was invited to speak today by a fellow member of the National Partnership of Lake Advocates, a group formed to find ways to manage the issues caused by wake boats. An engineering study conducted on our lake in 2020 as well as several other highly credible studies, conclusively shows that the large waves created by wake boats and wake surfing are five to ten times more powerful th than those from conventional boats and thus require much greater distance over which to dissipate to a non-threatening level for other watercraft. The 200-foot distance advocated by the boating industry is wholly inadequate. The potential for injury is real. Let me give you a few examples just from lakes in North Georgia. A passenger in a nearby boat was sent to the emergency room from being thrown about by wake surfing waves. An idling boat was thrown against a seawall by wake surfing waves. The hull cracked and the boat sank. A seven year old child was washed out of a boat by a large wake boating wave and died. An older man in a rowing skull was almost run over by a wake boat in surfing mode because the high bow angle obscured the boat driver's forward vision. A collision was avoided at the last minute, but the force of the waves broke the skull in half. On our lakes, parents now restrict children's canoeing and kayaking when wake boats are about. Pleasure cruising is frequently unpleasant and sometimes simply not possible. 
the quality of life on and around the lake is steadily diminishing because present regulations for separation are grossly inadequate. I urge you to implement the petition proposed today, and I hope that my state, Georgia, will have the wisdom and courage to follow your lead. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Next, we have on the list Mark Lieber. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. OK, and hopefully you can see me. There we go. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and I appreciate the state uh, following this really uh, transparent process. I support the petition. I also submitted brief comments in writing. Uh, I uh, have a property, uh, my wife and I, on Lake Raponda near Wilmington, Vermont. Uh, uh, it's been in our family for 59 years. It's a quiet place where not much goes on and we have uh, a lot of fun uh, 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 pat, uh, uh, paddle boating, canoeing, kayaking, swimming, and we've got neighbors who have a lot of fun water skiing. It's a wonderful place to be. Um, I uh, want to just echo Meg Handler's comments uh, on three things that I'd like the state to consider. Number one, damage to the environment. Number two, property damage. And number three, safety. Uh, and I'm echoing, I know, comments from others. The safety is a big deal. We have small children who canoe and kayak with us. Uh, just this past weekend, there was uh, a wake boat being used, and I was really afraid for my grandchildren that, that uh, their, their watercraft would be upset. The, wa the property damage, um, uh, we've got a dock. We've got you know uh, uh, grass and trees and stones that when these wakes come, man, they hit it hard. And it's just a matter of time before there's going to be erosion damage. And then the environment, uh, we have a loon nesting area. They happen not to be nesting this year, uh, but uh, if a wake would strike that, it would just totally wash away the loon uh, nesting area. And that's something that we've been really hoping that that they would take to our lake. Uh, lake Raponda happens to be one where there are no jet skis. And so I want to echo Meg's comments before that um, there are plenty of other places where people can use jet skis and wake boats, but uh, uh, no, for shallow lakes and narrow lakes, it's just not appropriate. Final point I want to make is the industry seems to say that this is just a matter of education, and it's not. Uh, that We need the state regulation. Uh, we have a put in uh, on our lake with clear signage, and it's ignored all the time. So uh, we need the regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Will Melton. I think you need to unmute yourself. Uh, can you unmute yourself? I'm going to unmute yourself. Well, I can't hear you. Yeah. OK, well, maybe we'll come back to Will at another time. OK, Jim Morgan. OK, he's coming up to the microphone. Uh, hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, we can. Go ahead. This is Will Melton. And uh, I'm uh, my wife and I own lakefront property at, uh, on Lake Rapun in Wilmington. Her family has been on the lake for at least 125 years. Both of us have been trustees of the Lakes Association, and I'm an officer of a foundation devoted to the promotion of Rapun's biological health. The lakes ecology is my primary aim in speaking up today, and I feel it's urgent that Vermont legislators act without delay to restrict wake surfing on shallow lakes as the petition requests. While it's upsetting to see a direct correlation between the arrival of wake surfing and visible changes to the shoreline of our family property, what I'm most alarmed about is wake surfing's unseen impact 
That is to the floor of the lake where so much of a lake's aquatic life looks for shelter, spawning sites, nourishment, and the higher levels of dissolved oxygen found in the deeper, cooler water. Rapunta is 12 feet at its deepest point. The evidence in the petition and simple logic tells us that when wake boats operate with their sterns weighed lower by ballasted tanks, the pitch of the propellers becomes much steeper, producing powerful downward hydro pressure that scours the lake's bottom. An example of the biological threat this activity poses is highlighted by an earlier comment about the common loon. For almost a decade, lake residents have worked with Vermont Center for Eco Studies to reestablish nesting of these rare birds that are native to Vermont. While loons may be able to dodge boat propellers, years of wake surfing will turn the bottom of the lake into a bare and a bare biological desert. The food sources for loons and so much more of the web of life that depends on lake bottom habitat to thrive. The visible imp impact uh, uh, in barely three years of wake surfing impacts shoreline habitat also and serves as a warning of the unseen damage. We would be fools um, to let this happen to a lake. Okay, we're going to have to cut, stop it there. Um, I'm going right. to start calling somebody and then letting know let folks know who's up next after. So we've got Jim Morgan, and after that will be Jenny Lawless. Jim Morgan, if you'd like to come back up. Three, charm, three times is charm. We'll give it a shot. Um, I'm going to change what I wrote down because I have more questions than answers. Um, I, I am part of the Lake Fairly Association, have been the entire time I've been on the lake, and uh, I disapproved of the way in which this petition was presented, or I should say not presented to the membership of the LFA. So a true vote of the LFA was never really taken in my mind. Uh, it may pass, it may not. Maury, our neighbor, it did not. My question is, for many of the experts that I hear, there are so many things that I read, the literature that I read, that I refer to the most recent article I could find, which is in 2020 from the University of Minnesota by Barr. Anybody wants to copy it, it's it. And they say that based on their studies of boats with small wakes, wake boats, the size of my boat, that they were unable to determine environmental or shoreline damage. Small boats, 3.5 or less. They were also unable to support the idea of a thousand foot barrier because the wave dissipates to less than four inches if you're 300 feet from the shore and four inches doesn't bother anybody. So that's my point about wake boats. It's mostly I don't understand. Finally, I'd just like to say that if Vermont wants to go after some rules, they should change their educational rules for requirements for operating any craft on Vermont waters. For some reason, Vermont has an age limit for when you need to get a license. If you're over 45, you're exempt. Why? Expensive boats are bought by old guys, and uh, they should certainly have to be certified. You should require recertification every five years, and it wouldn't hurt to check people's cert certification one time every summer at each boat landing. I don't see any reason why you couldn't do that. And if this passes and there are new rules, you have to have a way to disseminate those rules. Use what the Vermont Department of Health does. Send everyone an email. You have to click it, indicating you've received notification of new rules. That means you're responsible for them. So I see a tremendous need for better education, um, and I'd love answers to all the questions I raised about small weight boats. Thank you very much. Right, Jenny Lawless. Hi, can you hear me? Great. Um, and after Jenny, John Wooten will be up. All right, Jenny, go ahead. Now we can't hear you. You're on mute. Jenny? Can you hear me now? Yes. OK. All right. So uh, my name is Ginny Lawless. I'm from Lake Parker um, in the Northeast Kingdom in West Glover, Vermont. I had the opportunity to speak at the last public meeting, and so I'll keep my comments brief. I am um, in strong support of the petition by the Responsible Wakes for Vermont Lakes. And my concerns are mostly for the loons, as Will had mentioned, whose 
precarious nesting habitats would be at great harm from the um, waves caused by wake boats and wake boat sports. So I would like that to be in strong consideration for folks at this point in time. Thanks so much. John Wooten. Yes. Good evening. My name is John Wooten. We have a camp on Lake Parker in West Glover uh, for over 30 years. I am involved with our Lake Association as chair of the Fish and Wildlife Committee and with the Loon Watch Project. Most of my working career has been related to resolving disputes between parties on construction projects, listening to each side and separating facts from unsubstantiated opinions. In March 2021, comma, our Lake Association president volunteered me to look into the citizens group, which later became the responsible wakes for Vermont Lakes. Initially, I knew little about wake sports and my first impressions were that wake sports were good family fun. As I became more involved in this citizens group and did more research, reading the vast majority of the articles and studies attached to this position, petition, I became aware that the good family wake boat fund came at a cost to other lake and pond users and the environment. Those families trying to have the more traditional fun with swimming, paddling, fishing, and water skiing were being limited and bothered when wake sports were performed too close to shore and in shallow waters. Surveys have shown that wake boats are less than 2% of vessels on Vermont lakes and ponds. 98% are boaters or vessels with more traditional uses. The 2% of wake sport vessels should not control the overall shared use of small lakes and ponds. Short term wake sports, wake sport funds by a few should not be allowed to cause long term damage to lake environments presently enjoyed by the majority. For these reasons, I fully support the petition okay. as submitted to the ANR. Thank Great. you. Thank you. It's been two minutes. All right. So next up, we've got Ben McLaughlin, and followed by that is Brenda Plastridge. Ben is here. Good evening. My name is Ben McLaughlin. I worked. Uh, I've worked with the uh, Lake Fairly Association for many years. Uh, note that the Lake Fairly Association has uh, voted to support this position. Uh, this petition. Uh, however, I do not uh, for and I'd like to propose a few uh, items for consideration uh, to the NR is that uh, with regard to the thousand foot restrictions, the weights, the areas uh, or excuse me, thousand foot, the uh, the areas available to restrict for the wake sports uh, zones. I think this is a broad brush uh, applied to all sizes and all uh, styles of wake boats. And I think much like other craft, whether it be aircraft or or uh, or DOT regulations on weights and sizes of various uh, vehicles. Uh, I'm surprised that there's not a uh, another some sort of tiered approach to this because uh, the smaller vessels create smaller wakes. Uh, with when you're doing wake sports, larger ones do larger, and uh, perhaps there might be some uh, compromise with regard to the sizes and restrictions thereof in the various lakes. I think that the amount of restrictions that come in the available places to do wake sports and they, all the lakes are going to uh, also potentially provide an undue stress on the only few lakes that are in our area uh, around Lake Fairley. There's Lake Maury. There's going to be a lot of uh, boats doing uh, wake sports on that. I think that's an unfair uh, burden on uh, on Lake Maury, which I know hosts a lot of uh, camps. Um, I agree with some of the earlier comp uh, commenters about boater education. Uh, I've not only done my boater license, but I've taken U.S. Coast Guard uh, uh, courses and uh, have taken my education far beyond what the normal is required for a boater license in Vermont. And I think that in addition to my uh, to my lifelong uh, uh, execution doing wake sports and, and wakeboarding water skiing has contributed to my knowledge. I voluntarily have adjusted my um, my operation of the wake sports uh, in our lake, and I think that it's resulted in has been positive. And I'd be uh, I'd be proposed that we do similar to uh, to others. Thank you. 
All right, Brenda Plastridge, followed by Timothy Plastridge. Yes, hi, I'm Brenda Plastridge. I'm actually the president of Lake Parker Association. Um, we have, we're on a lake that is less than 300 acres. Um, and we have many roads that are next to the lake, right next to the lake, as many small ponds and lakes do in Vermont. Um, I would hate to see my property, uh, my lakefront property and any of the roads uh, destroyed by wake boats, by their waves. Um, this is also, and I wanted to mention this petition is, is not totally against wake boats. It is against wake boats on small lakes where they can do uh, such detrimental damage. So I, I think that needs to be into in consideration. Um, I am totally in favor of this petition. I do want to say that there are going to be a number of people that are against this petition, but in most in completely in life completely, we have rules and regulations and we need those. They are there for a reason. Um, just, I mean, it just came to mind, but I don't know if you can see it. Here's my, you know, fishing rules and regulations. There are re regulations in every part of our life and we need them. So I really would ask the state to look at this and consider um, everything and especially the small lakes. Thank you. Timothy Plastridge. Hi, good evening. My name is Tim Plastridge and I live with Brenda as my spouse on Lake Parker. We've lived here year round for 16 years. Um, I also serve as a recreation committee uh, chair for our Lake Association. And uh, just last weekend, I was sitting on our deck, looking out at the lake and just watching everyone enjoying themselves. I mean, there was kayaks, there were stand up boards, uh, across the lake kids were diving off their platforms. Uh, I saw water skiers and tubers even at the same time. And up in the south end, there was people fishing. Now, all this was happening at one time. And, you know, I'd like to say kudos to the whole Lake Association for the ongoing education we provide to all of our landowners for the safe and respectful use of our, uh, our waterway. It's pretty impressive. Um, we decided on January 3rd that we we're gonna go around in our boat and we we're gonna pass out ice cream to all the kids or even the adult kids that were on the lake. Uh, so we did that. It was kind of impromptu, but it would, turned out to be wonderful. Um, and uh, saw all sorts of kids enjoying sports of every kind. Uh, there was kids jumping off rafts, swimming, kids kayaking. In fact, we went up to one area, there was a couple of kids kayaking and they introduced themselves to us. First name, middle name, last name, which is unusual for kids this, in this age. Uh, but they were excited. They had brand new kayaks that their grandparents got them. And grandpa was out showing them how to paddle and teaching them all the good safety rules for being on the lake. Uh, so they paddled right out and got their ice cream. Other kids just stopped on rafts and we tossed them their ice cream. Some kids waited out and got their ice cream. It was just, it was just great fun. So we get, we get back and, and so we're sitting on the boat and I'm talking with my wife and saying, you know, the one thing that I recalled about every one of those people was they all had huge smiles on their face. And then, okay, so we thought, what happened? Two minutes, two okay, minutes. thank you. I'll be finishing up. So we thought, what happened if a water, a wakeboard came, a wake boat? All those smiles would disappear and so would the activities. So I'm hoping that, as I said, I'm an outdoor enthusiast. I'm hoping that the state realizes that wakeboard and wake boats have their place, but I hope they use common sense and putting them in the right space for their job, just like. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. thank you. So next up, we have Chris Owen and followed by that is Tom Ward. Good evening, Chris Owen, Worcester, Vermont, and a 31-year uh, 
owner of a uh, a pond front in a, a Northeast Kingdom pond. Because I'm an angler, I uh, cannot mention the name. Um, tonight, I'll express my personal opinions and uh, not representing any particular group. In May, I received a letter from the Department of Environmental Conservation Commissioner Beeling expressing gratitude for 30 years of service as a lay monitor measuring water quality on uh, that unnamed pond. To quote that letter, your monitoring work has helped us understand water quality and nutrient enrichment trends and helped us target interventions to reduce shore erosion and stormwater runoff into the lake, end quote. This year, the Department of Environmental Conservation will spend millions of tax taxpayers' dollars reducing phosphorus levels in Vermont's waterways, attempting to curb pollution that has already periodically closed multiple water bodies around the state. Look no further than Lake Carmi, Missisquoi Bay, St. Albans Bay, or Burlington's North Shore Beach. Over the decades on Vermont's lakes and ponds, I've observed many uses of uh, the public water. Most are benign. Wake boats, however, are destructive. Wake boats produce a surf-sized wake with seismic-like disturbance in shallow water. This is where thousands of years of nature's litter and nutrients are stored. Turbulence in the littoral zone of lakes and ponds disturb sediment and release phosphorus and other nutrients in addition to disturbing the whole ecosystem, the invertebrates, the, the this is where the, the, this is the nursery of our lakes and ponds where all life begins. Um, Thank you. All right. Let me, uh, let me uh, wrap it up, Laura. Thank you and Oliver for hosting this. Uh, Governor Scott and the Agency of Natural Resources are employed to keep our lakes clean, spend taxpayers' money carefully, and keep destructive crafts off our ponds and lakes. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we've got Tom Ward, followed by Mark Malazzo. Um, hi, my name is Tom Ward. I'm a full-time resident of Vermont, and our family has had a cabin on Lake Fairley for three generations. I'm also a member of the Lake Fairley Association that supports this petition. I have three quick points I want to make. First, at last week's Richmond meeting, a paid official from the Water Sports Industry Association spoke of their support for minimal wake boat regulation. The regulations they support include rules that already exist in Vermont, like wearing a life jacket, don't operate after the dark. To be clear, the Water Sports Industry Association's mission statement is to promote and protect all towed water sports activity, period. It is not to protect other users of Vermont's lakes not to protect lake shorelines, water quality, or water life, uh, or, or wildlife, and not even to protect the lakes that the industry needs for their sport, just to protect dead water sports. Weak regulation is a great way to protect the industry and nothing else. The petition proposes a rule to protect all of the above for the benefit of all Vermonters while allowing wake boats to operate where it makes sense. Second, some people wonder why the ANR should create a rule that may be difficult to enforce. Well, we follow rules all the time. We drive on the right side of the road, we stop at traffic lights, and over 90% of people wear seatbelts. I can't recall the last time I saw an enforcement officer on Lake Fairley, a lake where jet skis are prohibited. So why aren't there jet skis on the lake? Because Vermonters respect the rules. It's simple. And lastly, at last week's meeting, someone said, quote, I think that the science doesn't necessarily support the nature of the petition, end quote. He did not provide any science to back up his thought. People used to think that the moon was made of cheese and think the earth was flat. But once the science caught up, we learned that this was not so. The petition clearly lays out the science and facts and proposes a common sense rule to manage wake boats so they operate where the distance from shore is far enough and water is deep enough to limit their damage. I urge the ANR to implement the rule proposed by this petition. Thank you. Okay. Up next, we've got Mark Malazzo, followed by Jim Sawyer. Good evening. My name is Mark Malazzo. I live on Peach and Pond in Peach and Vermont. I was born and raised in Vermont and own, have owned power and paddle crafts most of my life. 
over a year ago, I was asked by our Lake Association president to sit in a couple of meetings with a group that was forming a look at the issues of wake boats operating in Vermont. I knew little about them at the time and came to the meeting with an open mind. Over the next year, I learned reading studies, discussion with people around the state and the country, content on the internet, that these boats, if not operated in a safe and appropriate manner, can negatively impact the environment, fish and wildlife, public safety. In developing our petition over many hours of the last year, we did not focus on emotion. We focused on science and we reviewed and included in our petition all relevant studies we could find. This includes two studies funded by the wake boat industry. Now the water sports and boat manufacturing association lobbyists and wake boat proponents tell us the science doesn't does not necessarily support the nature of the petition. <coughs> Excuse me that the petition contains a lot of exaggerated marketing and sales tactics that we're using emotions. But what you don't hear from the proponents is rebuttal to specific findings outlined in our petition. I came to the Richmond hearing expecting to hear specific details about inaccuracies or missing data in our petition, but only heard emotional responses. It has been argued that there should be more dialogue between the various stakeholders on wake boats use in Vermont. But where is a detailed peer reviewed study that rebuts what is outlined in our petition. Did proponents read our petition in details and all the associated studies? Did they submit further research and studies to the Vermont DEC to rebut our petition? No. Also, we've been told we did not engage with various stakeholders. First, our group engaged with dialogue with anybody that contacted us. Secondly, the National Manufacturer, Marine Manufacturers and Water Sports Industry Associations were well aware of our petition since they started paying lobbyists in Vermont around the time our petition was filed. Did they reach out to us to discuss and rebut the details of our petition? No, they didn't. I support the petition 100%. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so next up is Jim Sawyer followed by David Johnson. Yeah, Jim Sawyer here, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Uh, I live on Lake Elago, which is located in Greensboro and Crossburg, Vermont. It's a small lake, but popular with paddlers. I would like to review the boating regulations in the state of Vermont. These boating regulations state that a vessel should be operated at a no wake speed or five miles per hour within 200 feet of shore. Use of public water rules refer to this as a safety zone. Also, vessels may not be operated faster than five miles per hour within 200 feet of swimmers, wildlife, other watercraft, docks or swimming areas while on the lake. Boaters, paddlers and swimmers are encouraged to stay 300 feet away from a loon nesting site and from designated brooding sites. Boating or waterboarding too close to a loon nest may result in the loons abandoning the nest. In the petition to the ANR, the Responsible Wakes Group recommends a thousand foot safety zone distance from the shoreline for wake boats only. You notice we did not ask for a thousand foot from other paddlers, boaters and swimmers that are on the water. Just ask for a thousand foot from the shoreline. By adopting the thousand foot rule from shore and creating a 60 acre sport zone in water that is at least 620 feet deep will protect the shoreline. Even though the 60 acre sport zone is not reserved specifically for weight boats, while weight boats are operating in this sport zone, recommend that the ANR consider the safety zone distance of other boaters, paddlers, and swimmers who are on the lake recreating. Safety is very important for the people on the lake and protection of wildlife is also very important. I support the petition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have David Johnson followed by Laura Winter. My name is David Johnson. I'm a member of the petitioning group and I live on Lake Dunmore. I'd like to comment on the role of wind waves in shoreline erosion and challenge a position of the boating industry. Boating industry favors regulation requiring wick surfing to occur at least 200 feet from shore, even though their own measurements indicate such wakes are much larger than those from traditional water sports. In their most recent study, the boating industry's logic is that at this distance, Wakes from wake surfing are equivalent to natural waves from sustained winds of 20 miles an hour with a fetch of half a mile. Without evidence, they assert that such wind events are modest, implying that they occur frequently in our lakes. I decided to use high quality automated wind data from Vermont airports 
to see if there is a basis for this assertion. One such airport is a few miles from Lake Dunmore. Over a nine year period, winds greater than 20 miles per hour lasting more than 20 minutes occurred only six times with durations ranging from 20 to 40 minutes. Vermont inland lakes are not routinely pounded by waves from sustained high winds, and these events are not a relevant yardstick for comparison. The airport data also shows that strong winds in Vermont come typically from only one or two directions. Thus, there are large sections of the shoreline that almost never experience strong winds head on. These shorelines are vulnerable to motorboat waves and have been exposed for decades to waves from traditional sports like water skiing at 200 foot distance. Therefore, we asked at what distance from shore must wake surfing take place to cause shoreline disturbance equivalent to ski boats at 200 feet. As we show in our petition using recent University of Minnesota data, the answer is 1,000 feet. We've got Laura Winter followed by Jennifer Andrews. Good evening. My name is Laura Winter. I reside near Lake Raponda in Wilmington. I support the petition to manage wake boats. This week I looked at the Water Sports Industry Association's website. Their site admits that repetitively driving back and forth in the same line can damage shores and docks. They suggest passes should be kept to no more than three, saying, and I quote, after a few passes, you'll have turned up the water anyway. I fail to see how to minimize repetitive passes on small bodies of water. Another statement of theirs reads, staying at least 200 feet away from docks and beaches allows boat wakes to recede enough to minimize any adverse effects when they hit the shore. Minimize. This is considered inadequate by other lake management associations such as the MLASA and scientists from the University of Minnesota. Scientists have recommended that wake boating be avoided on any body of water with a depth of under eight meters or 25 feet. The enormous waves churned up by wake boats stir up sediment and phosphorus. This can enter local groundwater and encourages algae blooms and invasive species. It can also disrupt plant, fish, and insect life cycles, thus affecting the entire food chain. At this time, I no longer kayak with my dog for fear of being overturned by a wake boat, but I am not here out of concern for myself. I am speaking on behalf of the more than 50 friends, neighbors, and strangers who signed the initial petition I carried last summer for the environment and for future generations. I am here to honor <clears throat> What I have come to realize was a far-sighted warning my now 92-year-old dad made to me decades ago when I was a teen. As we stood looking at Lake Raponda, he said, they aren't making any more lakes. We've got to take care of the ones we have. I can't think of a better legacy than to do just that. Thank you. All right, we've got Jennifer Andrews followed by Don Griggs. Good evening, my name is Jennifer Andrews. Um, I reside on Shadow Lake in Glover in the Northeast Kingdom. I'm also the um, Shadow Lake Association president and I represent over 100 families who would also like to see regulations for wake boats. The Shadow Lake Association board supports this petition. I am here to ask the state to adhere to the rules that are already on the books about protecting the shoreline protecting animal habitat, protecting the spread of aquatic invasive species, to protect um, public use. Because water sports are family sports, and when wake boats occur on smaller water bodies, all other family activity ceases due to dangerous conditions. Wake boats um, are as an example of an activity that cannot be tolerated in smaller lakes and ponds because it impedes fishing, rowing, sailing, kayaking, paddle boarding, and swimming. It also, we also need to be sure to adhere to the public safety rules that are already on the books. First hand experience I have with wake boats was that a wave train came to shore and lifted me and my dock right off the bottom of the lake. 
if any of my under three-year-old grandchildren had been there that day, it would have ended badly. Thank you. Thank you. We've got John Griggs followed by Sharon Harkey. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. My name is Don Griggs. I live on Keyser Lake in Lovell, Maine, a 2,700-acre pristine lake 20 miles east of Mount Washington, New Hampshire. I'm speaking in support of the petition to manage enhanced wakes in Vermont. Today, I'm speaking about the threat enhanced wakes have on nesting wounds. We have several nesting pairs on our lake, and a few years ago, we noticed the chick count was down to one chick per season. People on our lake are very passionate about loons, and we were able to get a $40,000 grant from the Stephen King Foundation to study why we were not getting more chicks. We hired the professional company Loon Conservation Associates to help us better understand and document our loon population's breeding behavior. We built 10 floating nesting platforms to overcome water level changes. We learned how to optimally place the platforms to protect the loons from predatory threats. One of our platforms was on the lee side of a very small island, a perfect place. However, there was a predator that we had not counted on, very large wakes from a wake surfing boat. We have trail cameras viewing some of our platforms to monitor loon activities on this one and we recorded the large wake that tipped the platform to a high angle. At this location, we discovered a loon egg on the bottom of the lake, a lost opportunity to hatch a loon chick. The loon photos in the petition are the ones from this trail camera. I note that the petition does not seek to ban wake boats, but only to manage how and where they are used for the sport of wake surfing in the case of protecting loon nesting, sufficient standoff distances are required to allow wakes to decay down to about six inches or less. The proposed rules will achieve this goal, and I urge adaptation of these rules. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, so next up we have Sharon Hartay, followed by Glenn Schwartz. Can you hear me? Oh, Sharon, okay. Okay, so is Glenn Schwartz? Available? Glenn Schwartz. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Um, my name is Glenn Schwartz. I am the president of the Lake Elmore Association and a select board member for the town of Elmore. I'm here today to show my support for this petition. Lake Elmore is a small and very shallow lake. It is approximately 200 acres and has a maximum depth of 15 feet. The north end of the lake has a state park public beach that is enjoyed by many visitors throughout the summer months. I have read the petition and believe in the science that is presented. Fortunately, as of this time, we haven't had any wake boats at our lake. However, I am sure that it's just a matter of time until one shows up. My confidence in this statement is based on online and personal accounts from several states, including Georgia, North Carolina, Minnesota, Nebraska, Alabama, and others, where the number of wake boats has increased to such an extent that enjoyment of the lake is experienced by only a few wakeboarders at the expense of many and at the cost of significant environmental damage. Thus, if restrictions are not placed on these enhanced wake boats, lakes in the state of Vermont, including Elmore, will no longer be safe, environmentally friendly places to be enjoyed by this and future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Jack Witness, followed by David Ford. Good evening. My name is Jack Witness. I live round, year round in Wilmington. I am a member of the Responsible Wakes for Vermont Lakes. My comments tonight are focused on the scientific basis of our recommended thousand foot distance from the shore rule. 
as detailed in our petition on pages 13 to 24. We have copies if people would like to look at that. To be clear, the 1,000 foot rule applies only to wake boats, not to any other motorized vessels. This focus is because of the greatly enhanced wakes that wake boats generate. These wakes have resulted in much greater adverse environmental impacts relative to all other motorized vessels. These impacts include shortened, <coughs> include shoreline erosion, shoreline structural damage, and resuspension of near shore sediment. Numerous recent studies have been reported on the various characteristics of wakes produced by wake boats as they decrease over time and distance. The six most relevant studies, including the 215 Gaudi and Giraud industry supported study are included in our table three on page 15. Boat generated wakes consist of multiple individual waves referred together as the wake train. The most important wake train characteristics include the maximum wave height, the total wave energy and the peak wave power. The highly relevant 2022 Minnesota study justifiably compared these wake trains characteristics of wake boats with those of the traditional non-wake surf boats, that is water ski boats, at distances between 225 and 625 feet from shore. In our petition, we argue that the required wake surfing shoreline protection different distance be defined as the distance at which the maximum wake boat wave power are comparable to wakes from wake scoot wake ski boats in Vermont at 200 feet. According to our best fit of the Minnesota study data, this distance is 1,000 feet, and this is shown in tables four. Our extrapolation of the Minnesota data also argues that this is justified based on the increases in wake boats. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we've got David Ford, followed by Michael Ann Witness. Evening. My name is David Forbes. I'm a board member of the Lake Fairly Association, and I live on Lake Fairly. You've already heard from Ben McLaughlin, who is our president and is uh, arguing against this petition. Uh, I do want to commend Ben for his promotion and support of diversity on the board. The other 10 members of the LFA board, uh, let me make clear, are in unanimous mm -hmm. support of this petition. Uh, I'm also the co-chair of the Water Quality Action Committee, which was a subcommittee uh, appointed by the Lake Fairly Association to explore uh, environmental concerns, specifically phosphate levels, cyanobacteria levels, and the spread of milfoil within Lake Fairly. Uh, currently, the Lake Fairly Association's single biggest expense is the semi-annual application of basilicor. Uh, and hand pulling and suction harvesting of milfoil as well. I point this up because despite the fact that the use of wake boats on potential use of wake boats and current on Lake Fairly uh, pose a danger to future economic uh, impacts and current safety concerns, the longitudinal environmental effects are our committee's greatest concern. The wake boat essentially acts as the aquatic equivalent of a farm combine. It shreds, it spreads. It does irreparable harm to the lake bottom, to the flora and fauna within and around Lake Fairley. And given the fact that Lake Fairley's mission, uh, excuse me, the Lake Fairley Association's mission is to preserve, protect, and enhance the distinctive ecology and natural resources of Lake Fairley, and its surrounding watershed, it's necessary for us to speak up. Thank you. Next, we've got Michael Ann Witness, followed by Jim Lengel. My name is Michael Ann Witness, and I support the petition. I live on Lake Rapanda in southern Vermont, a small, narrow lake. 121 acres with a maximum depth of 12 feet. It's roughly one and a quarter miles long and 1,500 feet across at the widest point. Appendix A to the petition includes a link to a short video that shows wakes on Lake Rapanda from a wake boat 800 feet from shore 
bouncing a raft one and a half feet above waterline and overtaking a dock one foot above waterline. These are my raft and dock, so I am quite familiar with the visible effects on small lakes of the waves created by wake boats. They are much larger and more powerful than any wind waves we have. As for the non-visible and more insidious effects, I relied on the petition, reviewing the studies whose conclusions form the basis for the petition's recommendations. These studies were performed by independent researchers at universities within and outside the US using state-of-the-art instrumentation, and the results have been peer-reviewed. This is not an example of fear-mongering, as was suggested by a speaker at last week's information session. This is science. More than 40 state and national groups have written letters in support of the petition, indicating their belief that the science is correct. Another speaker at the last public session spoke about his lake's experience with wake boats, and it was positive. The number of wake boats has remained stable over time, and water cl clarity has never been better. Good news indeed for folks on that lake, but this is a sample size of one. Appendix A paints a broader picture by including nine pages of firsthand reports of adverse impacts involving wake boats on Vermont lakes, with links to reports of problems in other states as well. 16 states besides Vermont are currently considering wake boat legislation. For the welfare of Vermont's lakes and the people who use them, I urge the ANR to adopt the petition. Thank you. All right, we've got Jim Lingle followed by Lee Shen. Is Jim Lingle Lingle? Last call for Jim Lingle. Yes, I'm here. Can you oh, hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, very good. I'm Jim Lingle from Lake Elmore. Our family have been avid boaters for more than three decades. We've owned boats ranging from an ocean sailing yawl to an antique cabin cruiser to an electric pontoon boat to a fleet of canoes, motorboats, kayaks, and paddle boards. I've been licensed by the U.S. Coast Guard to serve as a charter captain and a boating instructor. I support the proposed rule to limit ballasted wake surf boats to large, deep lakes where they can operate more than 1,000 feet from swimmers, boaters, and the shoreline. Our four granddaughters swim, kayak, paddle, sail, and motor on Lake Elmore every summer. It's a small, safe, safe shallow lake surrounded by family camps at 50-foot intervals. A single ballasted wake surf boat operating on our small lake would drive our girls out of the water. The large, deep, unusual wakes would capsize their kayaks and endanger their swimming. Our camp gets its water from the lake. The prop wash from a single ballasted wake surf boat near our place would raise sediment from Lake Elmore's shallow bottom that would overwhelm our filtration system and render our camp unlivable. Over many decades, all of us who enjoy Vermont's lakes have learned to share these unique natural resources that we hold in common. Through neighborliness, regulation, and everyday courtesy, we have made our lakes work well for a variety of natural and recreational activities. I ask the Agency of Natural Resources to expand the distance that these deep wakes must keep from the shoreline, from the existing 200 feet to 1,000 feet, and to keep them in water that's more than 20 feet deep. Thank you for conducting this hearing. Thank you. Next, we have Lee Shen, Lillian Shen. Yes, hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Lee Shen. I'm the vice chair of the, of the Thetford Select Board, and I will report that the whole Select Board supports the petition. In Thetford, our local lake is Lake Fairley, as other people have noted, a small narrow lake. On it are summer camps that are over 100 years old, some of the first summer camps ever in Vermont. The lake is an, um, in, is an important driver of economic activity. From campers to day visitors to seasonal residents, these people all buy goods and services in our town. The problem with wake boats, as has been mentioned many times, 
is the power and turbulence of the wakes and the res resultant release of phosphate from the lake bottom. Phosphate is very good for feeding algal blooms, including blooms of toxic cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae. Algae and sediment reduce lake water clarity. Loss of clarity alone is detrimental to the economy that depends on a lake. Why? Studies conducted by the University of Vermont show that for every foot of water clarity that is lost, Lakeshore property values fall by 3% for year-long homes and by a huge 37% for vacation homes. And that is just loss of clarity. If you get cyanobacteria, it is even worse. On St Albans Bay, cyanobacteria blooms caused a decline in value of $50,000 per home for 37 lakefront properties in the town of Georgia. That is a huge loss to the tax base of that town, something that select board members are very concerned about, our tax base. Another serious issue with wake boats is the filling and emptying of ballast tanks. Typically, boats aren't transported carrying 5,000 pounds of water ballast. They fill their tanks on arrival and empty them when they leave. The lake. But they cannot empty out 100% of the water. So they start infestations of milfoil because they carry fragments of milfoil from one lake to the other. Okay, I think we're gonna have to wrap it up there. Next, we've got Ronald Bouchard followed by Daniel Sharp. Uh, this is Ronald, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, my name is uh, Ronald Bouchard and I've been a part and full-time resident on Joe's Pond on the Cabot side since 93. I've seen many changes to the pond during my time here, including the return of nesting loons, water level control measures, shore improvements, and steps to prevent invasive species like Eurasian meal foil from coming here. <clears throat> All of these things have, in my opinion, enhanced the safety, enjoyment, and overall quality of life on and around the pond. Now, Lindsay Miller, she's an ecologist with the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, Praise my wife and me for the efforts we put into planning and maintaining an ideal example of a healthy natural shoreline. This was achieved at no small expense of time or money, but my wife and I, by my wife and I. But with the increased operation of enhanced wake boats, we're regularly seeing these much deeper waves, much deeper than anything caused by nature, hit our shoreline and there are now signs of increased erosion that are impacting the protections that were originally introduced into our plan. And I'm a kayaker and I can tell you from firsthand experience, these waves can be dangerous if you're caught off guard and broadsided by them. Their energy can be quite disrupting and clearly have the potential of rolling you completely over. And that's even if there's only one ballasted wake boat operating on the main pond. It forces you to have to be hyper observant of their waves to the point that paddling becomes more of a chore than fun. Now, the Joe's Pond Association, along with the state, continue a program of boat access monitoring and education and have achieved the goal of keeping Eurasian milfoil out of Joe's Pond. Wake boats put us at a greater risk of transferring this invasive weed as they cannot be flushed out of their ballast tanks. So my wife and I completely support the goals that this petition address. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we've got Daniel Sharp followed by Ed Wells. Daniel Sharp, oh, you've got to unmute. Oliver, I'm not sure if you can unmute him from. Yeah, it's he's so far unmuted. It's like he's getting some support. Okay. Uh, but. Let's let's go to Ed Wells. Ed Wells. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm a lifelong resident of the state, currently living with my family in Richmond, Vermont. I have a brief story, if I may. The uh, sheer size of the waves from this wake boat 
which was not operating in wake surfing or wakeboarding mode, was very impressive. It was operating on the north end of Salem Lake in Derby last Friday. My seven-year-old grandson had three words to sum up what it was like to be broadsided by these waves while our 60-foot aluminum boat was anchored. His words were, that was mean. They were racing to shore to pick up passengers while doing so speeding between our boat and one other boat anchored close to shore. We left shortly after the incident, as did the other boat, ending what was otherwise an enjoyable fishing trip. I don't believe this boat intended to be mean that day, maybe just careless. Uh, we have two boats currently operating on Salem Lake, and I don't believe they in intend to be mean either. I have observed them over the past three to four years, curious about the effects of their incessantly pounding waves on water and plant health, especially on calm water days. Cloudy water and erosion around aquatic plant roots have been observed. These boats generally stay in the middle of this 788 acre lake. We have learned to stay clear of them in our paddle craft. Their wake lingers in this area long after the boat and sounds have left. When wake boats veer off center in the direction of our camp, our mooring lines and boats often take a beating from waves unusual in size, even during a heavy storm. I've heard similar stories from others around the lake. A 1,000 foot operating distance will help. The quorum of my fellow Lake Association directors chose not to support the petition because we only have two wake boats and the problem is not that great yet. I and many others who also care about Vermont's lakes and ponds respectfully disagree. That's why our lake is on the petition, a science-based, common-sense petition by a dedicated and thoughtful group. I strongly urge its acceptance as proposed. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Daniel Sharp. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dan Sharp and a petitioner. I live on Lake Iroquois in a seasonal camp. I've spent summers all my life messing around in boats, water skiing, swimming, sailing. It's been said that we're fear mongers. We're not afraid of boats. Some operators don't understand that our 200 foot no wake rule is a limit on powered boats producing more than a minimum wake anywhere within 200 feet of a swimmer, another vessel or the shore. Boat operators who don't follow this rule should be feared by swimmers. Your petitioners, however, like boats and use them. After all our research, discussions and experience on Vermont lakes, we believe that wake boats like jet skis need a special rule. We've been accused of sensationalizing. We referenced the Giggle Wave boat. It's an electric powered boat with heavy batteries, perfect for a wake boat. The manufacturer says it's the largest displacement wake boat ever, and that it will match, its wake will match the size of ocean waves. We didn't make this up, and we'll probably see one on Lake Champlain. For wake surfers, the Giga Wave will be fun. Even the local wake boaters agree that this boat doesn't belong on Vermont's inland lakes, yet there's no rule that prohibits it. A typical wake boat might displace 7,000 pounds, be powered by 450 horsepower. Does a boat like that belong on a Vermont kettle pond of 120 acres and a maximum depth of 12 feet? We think not. Wake boats are sensational on their own. Wake surfing is a fun sport for those who enjoy it. Our proposal identifies and provides reasonable venues for wake sports. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Mike Porcup, and I believe, yeah, um, Dave Johnson will be reading his statement. Then after we have Tom Lachlan. Mike Lachlan is a neighbor of mine on Lake Dunmore. Uh, he's been there since 1982, full time since 1998. He's uh, a volunteer with the Volunteer Center for Eco Studies Loon Conservation Project, and he closely monitors the loons and nests on Lake Dunmore yearly. Loons must nest within a couple of feet of shore for multiple reasons. 
balloons on Lake Dunmore have nested on our small uninhabited island for 12 or 15 years since the first nest. Our island separated to make two islands several years ago due to erosion from waves from boats. Trees have lost their ground to stand on and have fallen. The original loon nesting place on the north end of the island is now completely gone, and the present nesting site on the main island has narrowed from about six feet wide to about four feet wide in the last five years. In the last two years, the smallest part of the separated North Island has gone from a single vegetated patch to three or four smaller islets of rocks as the erosion rapidly continues. Further south, erosion has moved my waterfront about six feet closer to our camp in the last 10 to 12 years. Asking the boaters to move further offshore has been futile. Storm generated waves here reach 12 inches at a time or two a year. The sea boats, while in wakeboarding mode, create waves nearing two feet high, with some waves appearing well over that when they pass close by. It happens many times a day. Since the wake boats are new to the lake, most of the damage above has been from speedboats operating in wakeboard mode. The new wake surfing boats, according to their advertising, are designed to make waves to equal the ocean so that people can surf without being towed. I can't even imagine how quickly waves twice the size of those we have now will destroy our shorelines. I think regulation to stop these wave making activities on shallow, narrow lakes and enforcement of those regulations needs to happen as soon as possible to preserve what we have left. Thank you. All right, next we have Tom Laughlin, followed by Jamie Longton. Can you hear me, Laura? Yes. OK, I am Tom Laughlin and a resident of Wilmington and Lake Raponda, and I, I want to concur that I support the petition uh, profoundly. Uh, I, and I really appreciate all the speakers that have come forward to, to offer uh, uh, supportive remarks. I think it takes a village of people to get together and do the right thing. Um, we, we need to be good stewards of our natural resources. We do this as a community around Lake Raponda. So many of our, the homeowners, uh, have been working tirelessly for years to support our mission, which is to preserve and protect the natural resources and environmental health of Lake Raponda. It's a it's a community effort, and and we we continue to to strive to achieve that. Unfortunately, wake boats are contrary to that mission. Wake boats produce these very large, high energy waves, much greater than regular motorboats that pummel our shorelines, that shake boats, and shake the docks and the boats and stir up the bottom sediment, which as other speakers have noted, releases phosphorus that will result in algae blooms, some toxic like the cyanobacteria blooms. But so there are several specific adverse effects of these wake boats that we need to be concerned about. They, they increase, they'll increase shoreline erosion. They're, they're potential damage to our docks and our shoreline buffers, uh, increased incidence of algae blooms, including cyanobacteria that can be toxic to people. And maybe most importantly, unsettling safety issues for the many people trying to peacefully enjoy their kayaks, their canoes, their paddle boards, who get rocked by the wake boat's high intensity waves. These serious adverse effects are accentuated on small shallow lakes like uh, ours, Lake Raponda, which is okay. why wake boats need to be restricted. Thank you. We're to gonna larger have to cut it off. Lakes. So next we've got Jamie Longton followed by John LeBron. Jamie? Oh, curious. Okay. Hi, yes, uh, my name is Jamie Longton. I'm a native of Vermonter who's owned a camp on Sunset Lake in Benson for 30 years. 
For most of those years, I've been a champion in the environment, serving as Lake Association president, a volunteer lay monitor, an activist for water quality protection, a winner of the Yes. 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 Do I start over? No, continue. We hear you just fine. Where'd you go, Laura? What? But uh, continue. Maybe. Are you there? Yeah, we're here. Maybe you're frozen. I'm not sure. Maybe we'll come back to Jamie and um, we'll Hello. try. You're frozen up. Okay, we'll come back to you. Let's go to John LeBron and Jamie. You can try again after this one. Okay. Are you there, Laura? Okay. Um, can we mute Jamie somehow? <laughs> All right. All right. I turned I turned the camera off. Uh, Sunset Lake is a 195 acre deep water lake with a long stretch of natural undeveloped shoreline, part of the Pond Woods Wilderness. Sunset Lake has rules limiting the hours available for water skiing since 1972. This was a compromise solution to conflict. Conflicts between water sports and fishermen. Okay, I think, Jamie, we keep losing you. Um, so let's pause and come back. Let's go on to John LeBron. Okay. Um, hi there. My name is uh, John LeBron. I'm a resident of Wilmington, Vermont, near Lake Rapanda. Uh, for full disclosure, I am the chair of the Planning Commission in Wilmington, and I'm also the president of the Mount View Association, which is a homeowners association that has property on Lake Rapanda. Uh, my commentary here is strictly my own and not reflective of either organization. So I'll give you a more personal view and, and Appreciate everybody else's uh, views on the, the science, and we fully support uh, the petition. Uh, both my wife and I, uh, Lynn, are experienced kayakers, um, having kayaked anywhere from open waters in Alaska to the Florida Everglades. We kayak on Lake Ponda pretty much every day. We've seen a number of weight boats on Lake Ponda go from barely one occasionally to now seeing one every time we go out, including yesterday. Uh, without the weight boats on the lake, we normally see beavers, herons, loons, certainly not so much when the weight boats are on the lake. Uh, the amount of displacement on Lake Capondo and the size of the weight created is undeniable. As I mentioned, we're both experienced kayakers, uh, but even there are times that we need to see our kayaks through the point of the weight so as not to get swamped. Lake Capondo at 120 acres is simply too small to avoid them. The weight covers the entire surface of the lake from shore to shore, and crashes in the shoreline. I, I think we think I'm on the ocean to hear that. Uh, the Mountain View Association that I belong to, we have a small piece of property on the lake, and you can see the erosion caused by these wakes. Um, I, right now, our shoreline has a, a steep drop off to get into the lake, and I'm sure other property owners on the lake can attest to the same. You know, I fully understand, you know, the need to protect everybody's rights to use public waterways in Vermont. But at some point, common sense needs to be used. And these boats are simply not suitable for small lakes such as Lake Ponda. There have already been incidents of swamping on our lake, and some of my fellow association members, including one who spoke earlier, they're just not comfortable using the, the uh, water resource that's right in their own backyard. All right. of, give me one, one of any of water in Vermont that can be used by, you know, by everybody, but common sense should dictate that all bodies of water in Vermont are not suitable for all watercrafts. Fully support the petition. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Charles Labuke, followed by Tim, uh, who is, I believe, speaking for Mike Mortensen. So Charles Labuke. Yep. Hi. Um, so I was asked to speak um, last September. Um, a test was performed by Terra Vigilis Environmental Services, which I'm a uh, um, principal of. Uh, and it was through a Wisconsin DNR grant and the North Lake Management District funding. And it was specifically to measure phosphorus release by royal effect, which is where you know the bottom sediment is disturbed, creating water turbidity. And this was specifically a test done uh, to look at the wave propagation produced by a wakeboard boat in surf mode 
operation. And we set up a buoyed course, which was 200 feet from the shoreline. And the course was approximately 800 yards long. Measurements of phosphorus were to be obtained both before and after the disturbance of sediments produced by just two passes of a wakeboard boat in surf mode operation. At three sites along this course, water was sampled um, just below the water surface at a distance of about 100 feet from the shoreline where the water depth is just three to five feet. With a total of just two course runs, one north and one south, that were made by the wake boat in surf mode, and that was with full ballasting with a raised bow angle and roughly 10 mile per hour operating speed. Um, other calm water conditions were present and no other boat traffic had occurred prior to that in the morning testing. The water depth along the buoy course ranged from 25 feet of depth at the southern end to just 15 feet at the northern end with an average depth of 20 feet. The data obtained from uh, certified laboratory analyses showed that an increase in phosphorus levels in the water column was from 17 to 33 percent within just the 30 minutes of the initial disturbance of the two passes of the wakeboard boat in surf mode. So that was an average increase of 25 percent across the three sampling sites from the disturbance of sediment by waves propagating from wakeboard boat in surf mode. I just wanted to present some additional scientific evidence. Thank you. Uh, this has been two minutes. Uh, next up, we've got Tim, who's speaking from Mike Mortensen. OK, you've got communications from Tim coming. You can hear me loud and clear. Yeah, and just to let folks know, next up, we have Ed Sims. So go ahead, Tim. So good evening, all. First, my commendations to the Vermont Responsible Wakes Group and the Vermonters. Uh, your comments are thoughtful, and I really encourage you to stay ahead of this problem. Uh, I'm one of the principal investigators on a three-year Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources funded study looking at wave propagation impacts from various powered vessels on an inland freshwater lake in southeast Wisconsin. This is a collaborative research effort between a commercial drone company that has both aerial and submersible drones so we can image things and Carroll University, Departments of Aviation Science and Chemistry and Environmental Sciences, as well as the South uh, East Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. And uh, I speak today uh, by invitation concerning a portion of our work, uh, a small portion of the work, that measured specifically the propeller downwash depths by wake boats in surf mode. Our research team engineered a 30 foot aluminum pole, which was secured vertically in the lake. That device had horizontal fixtures placed at five foot intervals uh, all the way down to 25 feet. And at the end of each of these fixtures, there were fiber optic strands those strands were movement sensitive to any downwash energy. Each of the wand fixtures had a camera and a light extending on the horizontal axis to capture with video filming the downwash impact. We have documented wake boat surf mode operations to a depth of 20 feet. So we're one of the research groups that's generating some of the science. Comparative data with typical lake vessels on small inland lakes pontoon boats, personal watercraft fishing boats, they don't show these effects as their prop wash dynamics are generally horizontal to the surface and remain within okay. three to five feet. I'll finish up in just a moment. So similar data to ours is coming from Payette Lake out in Idaho and University of Minnesota St. Anthony Lab. Thank we'll you very finish much. up our study in a phase three and then talk about the impacts on the um, and you Marine can submit more life comments plant life. in writing, but we do need to move on. I want to okay. acknowledge that it's 7.30, but we still have, I believe, 12, 13 people signed up to speak. So we'll okay. keep going. Thanks These are the much. people who signed up ahead of time. Um, so next, we have Ed Sims, followed by Jason Knowles. We want to make sure all the people who signed up at the proper time scale can speak. Thank you. I'm. My name is Ed Sims. While I'm currently not a Vermont resident. resident. My family has vacationed many times in Vermont, and we have particularly enjoyed our time on 
Vermont Lakes. In addition, our daughter is a graduate of Vermont Law School, so we feel a particular kinship to Vermont. We now live on a beautiful North Georgia lake in the mountains of North Georgia, which has been dramatically impacted by unregulated wake boats. I've witnessed personally the significant impact and damage they've done to the shoreline, the docks, and other watercraft. More importantly, though, they pose a danger to others. Last year, while taking a leisurely cruise at dusk with my 73-year-old wife, in our 20-foot inboard, we noticed a stationary wake boat not far from us. What we did not realize was that the wake boat had just stopped pulling a wake surfer. Suddenly, without notice, a large wake boat wave from this boat hit our boat, threw my wife in the air, and she hit the side of our boat as she came down. Luckily, I was able to hold on to this steering wheel. My wife had to be rushed to the hospital emergency room with very painful bruised ribs and a strained back, and she was lucky not to have been either thrown overboard or suffered broken ribs or a broken back or both. This problem is not limited by state boundaries. Unregulated wake boats clearly pose a danger to other people and should be regulated as proposed by the responsible wakes for Vermont Lakes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we've got Jason Knowles, followed by Cheryl Beal. Thank you. My name is Jason Knowles. I'm the Director of Operations at the Aloha Foundation in Fairleigh, Vermont. We operate five summer camps located on two lakes, Maury and Fairleigh. The health of both lakes has most recently been rated as poor. In addition to the failing health of our lakes, we're concerned that the artificially enhanced wakes can present safety hazards for swimming and traditional unpowered boaters. Canoeing, kayaking, paddleboarding and sailing are integral to our programs and to the culture of both our home lakes. Upon reopening our camp programs for the summer of 2021, we experienced an, uh, these enhanced wakes firsthand and determined that they are incompatible with traditional recreational uses. The enhanced wakes create significant safety issues, including potential capsizing of canoes, smaller sailboats and paddle boards, in particular when operated by our youngest and least experienced campers and staff. The camping industry across Vermont supplies thousands of jobs, contributing essential economic benefit and tax revenue to their communities. We support local small businesses and provide critical development experiences to thousands of children and staff alike. An economic impact report conducted in 2017 ca calculated that Vermont's 110 day and residential summer camps have a direct impact of $60 million on the Vermont economy. Our industry is severely under threat by the decaying health of and the safety on our lakes. We recognise that apart from environmental concerns, the ANR seeks to balance the public uses of Vermont's waters for the benefit of all Vermonters and visitors to our state. We believe that among the many literal gems in our state, some may be large enough to support such uses without straining their environment or crowding out more traditional lake activities. Smaller lakes may continue to be negatively impacted without regulatory intervention. Thus, I'm really almost there. We, there by, we strongly urge you uh, to change the water use uh, rules to enable the management and, um, of wake boat activity across our state. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got Cheryl Beal up, followed by Jane Marinsky. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. My name is, good evening. My name is Cheryl Beal. Um, my husband and I have um, had a house on Lake Raponda for the past 30 years. And um, I know some of my neighbors have already spoken about some of the problems of wake boats. I wanted to focus on a real concern that is happening on our lake 
in the last three years. In the summer of 2020, when my son first noticed there were algae blooms on the lake um, around our dock and on the shoreline, um, the algae, the blooms were tested and it resulted in uh, the beach that is also part of the lake being closed for a few days. This happened at the end of July in 2020. Now we're already in July 2022. And my son, again, has noticed algae blooms occurring on the lake, but this is three to four weeks earlier than we have seen in the past. Um, we strongly support um, not allowing, uh, limiting lake boats on small lakes like ours. We're already seeing the damage and it will ruin, continue to ruin the lake for other people. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we've got um, Jane Marinsky followed by DC Dennison. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. I listened on June 29th at the Richmond hearing as comment spoke about the cordiality of Lake Iroquois and how education was the best way to deal with the problem of wake boats. The cordiality is extended by motorboat drivers to other motorboat drivers, not always to the many others using the lake. In 2014, I was swimming um, I was hit by a motorboat that was speeding within 200 feet of shore. I was pulling a pink buoy behind me to make me visible to boaters. The impact resulted in 13 fractures and six ribs, a hemothorax in each of my lungs, a broken sternum and severe bruising. Many in the boating community said it was my fault and I shouldn't have been swimming when motorboats were out. I was told I shouldn't be swimming in the lake without a boat beside me. Nothing in the rules require a swimmer to have a boat with them. One commenter at the meeting misrepresented the boating rules when he said that kayakers mostly stayed within 200 yards off the shore where they belong. These boaters seem to think swimmers, paddlers, and kayakers are not allowed in the middle of the lake. They don't understand that they, the boaters, when making a wake, are responsible for staying 200 feet away from other boats, motor or not, swimmers and paddlers. Kayakers and swimmers mostly do stay close to the shore because they fear the boaters. The boaters, many of whom have stated they have boated on Vermont for decades, do not know the rules or choose not to obey them. So I do not think that education or cordiality is the answer. The answer to the problem of wake boats is to keep them where they cannot harm the environment and people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so next we've got DC Dennison followed by Kathy Newberry. Hello, uh, my name is DC Dennison and I'm from Thetford. I live near Lake Fairley. Uh, and I'm grateful to the State Department of Environmental Conservation for holding this public hearing. And first, let me say that I appreciate and value the time that Lake Association board members serve. And as a former board member for many years and chair of the Lake Fairley Association, I know what dedication is required to do that. I'm very near to Lake Fairley, have owned land on it and am devoted to its nature and beauty, having swum in it from the time I was a little girl. I remember the clear water, the sand between my toes, the occasional cut from the shell of a freshwater mussel and the oh so cooling effect on a hot summer day. It's part of the center of my world. With this history in mind, I ask that you hear my concern. I already know about milfoil. We were battling it when I was on the board. I know about the pollutants. And even so, I know how much joy this lake has brought and continues to bring to people near and far. Not to mention all the summer camps for children, depending on its shore. This joy is in jeopardy. Recently, while enjoying an afternoon on a friend's porch, I saw a seemingly enormous boat deep in the water with the boat bow very high, uh, coming down the lake and making a wide turn at the end where Lakeshore Road is. 
It looked completely out of place and belonged on a much larger lake. If there were two or more of them, they wouldn't have enough room to enjoy their ride. It was loud and left a huge wake. More important was the fact that there were people swimming off their small, board, uh, small boat out in the lake and it seemed impossible that they could be seen over the bow. People in kayaks and canoes rocked dangerously with the wake and paddleboard people were topped off. This is all what I saw. Um, as one who kayaks myself, I know how even a smaller boat can generate a wake that takes skill to manage. Another time I was sitting on a dock at the end of the lake and I could see the shreds of milfoil floating in the water, obviously stirred up by these boats. And I was aghast. Okay, thank you. It's been two minutes. Let's move on to Kathy Newberry, followed by Sue Clayton. I didn't get the rest of it. I should have tied it. Good. My name is Kathy Newberry and I live in Thetford, Vermont. I don't live on a lake, but, but my husband David and I use Lake Fairley, which is partly in, um, part of which is in Thetford. I share the concerns that several speakers have expressed regarding the effects of wake boats on the environment. And I'm especially concerned about the ways in which the waves from wake boats can endanger other people engaging in different activities such as kayaking, swimming, sailing, canoeing, and paddleboarding. For this reason, my husband and I strongly support the regulations proposed in the petition. Residents of Thetford who don't live on the lake, on Lake Fairley, have access to it through a public boat launch and Treasure Island, a town-owned facility on the lakeshore, which includes swimming access. That is the only public place in Thetford with a lifeguard where people can go to swim. Both adults and children of all ages use the beach for swimming in the summer. And as has been mentioned, there are also several summer camps on the lake. Young children and teenagers frequently use the lake for recreation, but wake boats present a safety threat for people engaged in these others' activities. My husband and I will be visiting Treasure Island regularly this summer to take our toddler grandson to go swimming there. I worry if he will be safe should a wake, bo wake boat come by and cause a big wave. Just last week, two people in kayaks in, on Lake Fairley encountered a wave from a wake boat and, and capsized and they had to be rescued. I'd like to quote uh, an article that appeared in the Valley News in April of this year. Um, in an interview with Robert Bartlett, who has owned the boat retailer Fairley Marine for 35 years, he was asked what he thought of the, regula the regulations proposed by, um, that we're discussing right now. His response was, no way. That's crazy. 200 feet, I think 1,000 feet is very appropriate. That would eliminate virtually all lakes in this area, and it should. Well, right. actually, Lake Maury would not be eliminated. Okay, so that's two minutes. Thank you. Um, Sue Clayton, I got a message that she couldn't log on, so I don't believe she's here. Um, so that'll take us to Mon Monique Priestley, followed by Richard Gagney. So Monique. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Monique Priestley. I live in Bradford and I support the petition. I'm an open water swimmer and paddleboarder. Um, I'll read a portion of submitted remarks. Uh, I completely respect that everyone chooses their own way to engage with our natural world. Um, when that engagement erodes the environment, spreads invasive species, negatively impacts wildlife, and poses a threat to other people, I lose my respect for such disruptive behavior. Such behavior shows complete disregard for anyone or any creature but the person getting a thrill at the expense of others. I have personally had several close calls with wake boats. The scariest were on the 85-acre Halls Lake. In, 2020, um, in 2020, I shared the following incident with the Halls Lake Association. I arrived early when meeting a friend and her children for a visit and decided to swim out, out to the right side of the beach well within 200 feet of the shoreline. I had just waited for a windsurfer to pass when I looked up and saw a speedboat heading straight for me full throttle. I had never had that happen, so I froze for a second and then started waving my hands over my head and yelling. The boat came within feet of me. I thought for sure it was going to hit me. The driver never saw me, but his passengers freaked out and finally, uh, after finally seeing me wave my arms over my head after they passed. He drove over to tell me that he didn't see me and that it's too hard to see over the bow of a boat when it's traveling at high speeds. 
It is ridiculous that anyone should be able to drive a boat at high speeds on a tiny body of highly populated water when they can't see whether they're going to run over a person, loon, turtle, or any other being that lies before them. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Richard Gagney, followed by Joel Barfield. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for letting me speak today. My name is Richard Gagne, and I live on Joe's Pond in Cabot, Vermont. We have been on the lake for well over 20 years, but we moved to our current location on the Large Pond in 2008 and built a new home in that lot. Um, we rebuilt the wall at the time we did the home, and a year or two after that, our first wake boat showed up. In two summers, it ruined our wall with the waves extending over the top of the wall, which is a minimum of two feet from the water level. Needless to say, we had to have our wall rebuilt, and it was very costly. It was completely, completely redone, and I believe done correctly with crushed stone and, and, and everything behind it before seating it up. That was done in around, I think it was completed in 2018 or 19. But since then, we've had several new wake boats on the pond. In the past two summers, they have damaged our wall with those wakes. I've had to fill in two washouts behind the wall. One was literally, you drop a soccer ball into it, and it went right down to the water level. So anyway, that's been repaired. I also have current concerns about the long-term impact on shoreline erosion around the pond stirring up the pond bottom, spreading invasion species, as well as boater, swimmer, paddle boaters, kayakers, etc. safety. I can tell you of several instances on the pond, I'm sure the a and is aware of them by now, where others have had unsafe instances directly with these boats. We have less than 400 acres, and 75 roughly of those acres are on the two small ponds, and the third pond, is probably just over 300 to 325. I think, I believe that wake enhanced boating on such small ponds and lakes is not prudent and allowing such activity is against the best interest and in preservation of the lakes and ponds within the state of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Joel Bartfield followed by Christy Kano. Joel? All right. Uh, Christy Kano, are you here? I know she was oh, yep, go ahead, Christy. Can you hear me, Laura? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Um, I can't hear you. You're garbled, but um, I guess I'll just try to say my spiel. Um, I am a lifelong Vermonter supporting conservation of Vermont lakes and ponds. The water sports industry never acknowledges the truth that wake boats can cause environmental damage because they have a vested interest in accelerating wake boat sales and profits. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go right ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, the scientific literature review supporting this petition clearly indicates wake boat generated enhanced wake energy and surf mode propeller thrust impact pose significant aquatic environmental threats, ecosystem impairment, and water quality degradation, underscoring A&R modernize its water use rules and adopt regulations to mitigate wake enhanced impacts before they do irreparable harm. Premium wake boats are bigger and heavier with 600 horsepower for bigger waves. When enhanced wakes from 200 foot distance from shore severely pound the shoreline, cause damage, endanger people and wildlife, the boat is too close. The scale of the waves matters as much as the persistence of the energy. Wake enhanced sports need to move to deep water and maintain the science driven 1,000 foot distance from shoreline for powerful wakes. 
the residual ballast water moved between water bodies is constant and a profound risk for entraining live aquatic invasive species like zebra mussels with no known human control. All it takes to ruin a beloved lake is one wake boat to suck up AIS infested water into its ballast, okay. transport that boat to a new water okay. body and empty that ballast. Okay, we need ballast decom procedures in place. Okay, minutes. Sorry. Okay, so next up we have Chris Holmes, and then following that, the last speaker um, will be speaking for Sharon Harkin, who signed up earlier. So, Chris Holmes. Okay. All right. All right, so Sharon Harke was not here earlier. She called her name on the list and she emailed her statement to be read. So this is the last one. Um, I'm Tom Ward speaking for Sharon Hello. Harke. Oh, oh, somebody's trying to talk. Hello. Yes, this is Chris Holmes. I'm sorry. I oh, didn't okay. know I had to so yes. fix one. Sorry. Okay, Chris Holmes, go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Holmes. And I have a 90 acre, I live on a 90 acre lake in Nebraska that's less than 60 acres of total water for boating activities. In six years, we went from two wake boats to 30 wake surfing boats. Our water quality has suffered and wakes are so large at times, it makes it unsafe for other activities. It tears up the shorelines and pulls up the vegetation used for fish habitat. No other boating activities have such a negative impact on our lake like ballast boating does. Wake surfing technology has changed a lot in six years. Going forward, the industry is making the boat's minimum horsepower 400. So more horsepower provides more torque and power, which means boats can carry more weight, people, and equipment, all of which make bigger waves. The Water Sport Industry Association used the Gowdy study to push the 200-foot distance and is the basis for their Wake Responsible campaign. Before you decide to entertain their recommendations, please ask them the following questions. Was the Gowdy study peer-reviewed? What does the WSIA determine as repetitive passes? They say a few, is that three? What size lake or river would they say is too small for wake surfing? I would encourage you to look at the WSIA website and see who its members are. You'll find the members are boat dealers, boat and marine engine manufacturers. The WSIA is the towed water sports industry leading advocate. There are numerous scientific studies, such as the latest Minnesota SAFL study that proves unbiased research and has been peer reviewed by industry experts help form your decision. Wake surfing boats create bigger wakes no matter the activity. This accounts for studies that have varying distance recommendations from 500 to 1,000 feet. Tubing or water skiing with a wake surfing boat will still create a larger wake than a water skiing or pontoon will. You can protect the Vermont waterways before it's too late, and I implore you to do so. I wish we had the ability to do the same in Nebraska. We have way too many boats. We are the poster child of what not to allow to happen to your lakes. Once All they right. get on here, you cannot remove them. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. All right. And our final comment, this is uh, for Sharon Parquet. Um, and Tom Ward is reading her comment. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, good evening. I'm Sharon Harkey, <laughs> chair of the select, uh, Thetford Select Board. Our town owns and runs Treasure Island on Lake Fairley. Treasure Island is a recreational facility and nature area that includes a beach, swimming, and a place to launch kayaks and canoes. One of the reasons we are deeply concerned about wake boats is that their wakes threaten the safety and comfort of our swimmers and boaters. Another reason we're concerned is that the wakes are known to damage the shoreline, a shoreline that we're offering, uh, I mean, that we're doing our best to protect by teaming with Lisa and Nikolai who is doing a lake-wise assessment and offering advice of the best ways to make sure the shoreline stays intact and the plants and wildlife flourish. Lake Fairley is too small to, to accommodate these boats and their destructive waves. We ask that you help us prohibit the use of them on Lake Fairley and other small lakes in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the commenting from people who signed up ahead of time by the deadline. Um, and we've 
we're past our 730 cutoff time, so we yes. don't have time yeah. for I'm gonna make one exception. Okay. There's some people in the room. I believe it's Eric Splat and I'm sorry, is it Maureen? Lauren, excuse me. They comment they asked to sign up late, but they travel to the meeting. And I'd like to make one exception to allow either Eric or, or Lauren to, to make a quick two minute comment if they'd like to, and then we'll wrap it up. So hi, I guess I'm one of the only ones on the side of the boating industry and boating lifestyle. I've uh, done it basically my whole life. Our family owns a, operates Woodard Marine, 60 plus years of business. Um, you know, doing all kinds of boating myself, I see everything all over the board. And one of the most things that I, that I think in general in boating, not just wake boats, is the education. Even though people say that's not a big aspect of this, it is. A lot of people, um, own boats, get out on boats, and it's the person behind the wheel. So, and that being said, I definitely think education process um, and different things like that would make a big difference. Also, um, wake boats in general, compared to other boats, um, aren't really trailered from lake to lake, and as far as invasive species go and different things like that, I definitely see that being said. Um, most people have never seen their trailer. The boat goes where they live and then back into storage for the year, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, def definitely education and um, just awareness. But that's all I have to say tonight. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I thought it was important to make that one exception given that they traveled to the meeting. And for those that did sign up late, uh, I'm sorry, we've passed our, our meeting time. And so we're gonna conclude the verbal comment period for the second meeting here. As mentioned, if, if you wanted to speak but weren't able to tonight, uh, please submit your comments in writing between now and 4 p.m. on July 29th. Uh, for those of you that are still with us, thanks for braving a two and a half hour meeting. Uh, we appreciate your interest in the subject. For those that made comments, thanks for taking the time to comment and share your opinions on this. We do have a hand raised. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a second. So I think I'll, I'll handle those. It is, it is running late. I don't think we're going to get into a detailed answer. I think on the first question, yeah. So the first question was, if, if you're in the th if you're in the wake sports zone, a thousand foot from shore, does the petition also contemplate a larger distance uh, than the current 200 foot requirement? Uh, for 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 boats operating the wake sport zone, be they a, a boat in wake surf mode or another moat, another another boat, the petition is silent on that point. Uh, that's something that we'll contemplate. Uh, the current rule about a 200 foot distance may or may not be adequate if if we were to do any rulemaking under this point. But the petition is is silent on that point. I'm not qualified to to answer your second question. I think that's one that we should put into the record and respond verbally. So if you if the question I believe is how are we distinguishing between the ballast tank situation with a wake boat versus a live well tank? I think that's the term you used. Is that correct? Yeah. OK. Thank you. So the, So the commenter is, is asking us to make a dis see if there's a distinction that needs to be made between live well tanks and the ballast tanks. The wake boat, uh, the petition maintains that the ballast tanks on a wake boat cannot be fully emptied. That may or may not be the case with a live well tank. I just don't know. I apologize. So we need to make that distinction. So we'll respond to that point as well. Thank you for the questions. So we're going to wrap it up here. Thanks for your patience and sticking with us. 
as I said, this is our, our second meeting. Uh, we, we, we're going to wait till the end of the month to get all the comments. We'll compile the, the verbal comments most we have received to date. This meeting will be posted online, hopefully by this time next week, if not sooner. Uh, then I, I see us in August kind of entering to the next phase in the public participation of pre rulemaking. And we'll reach out to different groups who could be affected by this petition at that point. Um, we'll begin to review the comments, the, the all the studies in the petition and the other new studies that are brought to our attention and move incrementally down that uh, pre rulemaking phase towards a recommendation to the secretary. I do anticipate uh, convening first individually with different industry groups as well as uh, user groups, recreational user groups. And if there seems to be a value in it, convening folks together as a group for some discussions, see if there's any conflict resolution, if you will, that can be achieved uh, through a consensus process um, as part of our pre making efforts. So those that are have commented, those that have submitted the petition, please stay tuned for that phase of the process, which I view as consistent with Section 2.4 of the use of public water rules. Uh, thanks to our colleagues from Fish and Wildlife Department and State Police uh, for attending tonight. Thanks to the public for coming out and um, stay tuned for updates, which will be available on the Vermont DC Lakes and Ponds rulemaking page for next any additional steps in this process. Thank you. <clears throat> With that, I'm going to leave the chat and